You're going to showboat, knock down the shot. For what his value is, it doesn't equate to winning basketball. When you're talking about the greatest of greats, that's what you have to do. You have to nitpick. We'll see you in the playoffs. We'll see you in the playoffs. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the TML Podcast. I am Jace Eustace, joined, as always, by Jared Huff. Jared, we are in the middle of conference finals here in the NBA playoffs. It has been an exciting playoffs so far. A lot of other things going around the NBA. We'll touch on a little bit of the draft lottery, but how are you doing, my man? Well, aside from my playoff bracket, basically looking a lot like my March Madness one this year, um, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> it's been great watching uh, all these games over all this time. And it's just shown me how little I feel like I know about the NBA at times or how matchups are just going to go. But we've just seen so many great series so Absolutely. far. Absolutely. It's, it's been a great playoff so far. I yeah, love it. We, we've been blessed. There's been a lot of great series, a lot of surprises too, which a lot of the times in the NBA, as far as the series winners, we don't see a lot of surprises. Sometimes teams will come out and get a game or two, but we've seen, obviously we're sitting here in conference finals. We've got a seven seed still playing and we have an eight seed still playing. So obviously you got your ones and twos in there as well, but it's just nice to see some of those lower seed two play in teams still playing here with a chance to go to the NBA finals. So we'll mm-hmm. get into that. And what better place to start this podcast than the game that took place last night? It'll be two nights ago by the time you guys are hearing this. But that is the Denver Nuggets taking game two, going up 2-0 against the Los Angeles Lakers. So just kind of starting at the beginning of this series, what have you kind of seen in game one or two? How do we kind of end up here 2-0 Nuggets going into game three? Well, I have to start by saying Jamal Murray might be one of the best big game performers I've seen in like the last 10 years of watching the NBA. I mean, we've seen big games from him before in the playoffs, but back-to-back incredible games, including a 23-point fourth quarter last night, is insane. I mean, the man was taking three-point shots in front of anybody. He'd have AD switch on onto him. He'd have LeBron switch on to him. It didn't matter who was in front of him. The man was going to take the shot. He made the shot twice in LeBron's face, I might add. Like, he had ice in his veins, no fear, and it was a spectacular sight to see it was fantastic what do you think of that yeah no that sucked you know someone who was <laughs> born, born for the lakers 100 percent, that was not good but it was one of those where sometimes guys just catch fire and it was you could see even after he hit those first couple shots and i think it was that second or that third one where he looks over at mike breen he's hitting himself with that you know bang bang you know on the court like he knew he was feeling it And what sucked is that in that game, the Lakers seemed to pretty much the entire game had about a 10 point lead. It kind of, you know, it Mm -hmm. it fluctuated back and forth between the two, but they literally, it was as soon as he went on that run, it just kind of had the feeling like you don't know if the Lakers, because they've been so honed in on Jokic on the offensive end, if all of a sudden they were going to have to switch their focus to Jamal Murray. As soon as he knocked down those first couple of shots, I think Michael Porter Jr. knocked down a big shot and uh, Bruce Brown knocked out a big shot in the corner too. They started hitting those threes in the fourth quarter. It was, it, it just kind of had the sense that the, the Nuggets were going to come back and take that game. It, it, it So to be honest with you, it sucked. That fourth quarter was rough last night for me, 100%. Yeah, but I think that's the thing with this Nuggets team that the Lakers are going to have to realize that this team's very different from any team they've faced yeah. in the playoffs so far. Uh, you look at the Grizzlies, they were shorthanded, so they didn't have a lot of size without Brandon Clark and Steven Adams. So mm-hmm. obviously that played into the Lakers' hands. Is You can play LeBron at the 4, AD at the 5, or even play LeBron at the 3, AD at the 4 or 5, and another big player in that lineup if you want to throw Rui Hachimura in somewhere. Yeah. Um, like The Lakers have been a bigger team than all their opponents up until this series. Like Look at the, the Warriors. The Warriors were top-heavy at the guard position, and the other big players are like Kevon Looney, who's undersized for a center, and Draymond yep. Green, who's undersized for a four. Not that it's really affected Green throughout his career, as he's a fantastic defensive player. But this Nuggets team actually has size. Michael Porter Jr. is a big player. Absolutely. Nikola Jokic is a big player. And that's something the Lakers are having to deal with and contend with. As we've seen, AD has struggled, and he was terrible last night. I was shocked to see he even had 18 points at one point because it felt like any shot he took, it wasn't going in. It was mm-hmm. it was hard to watch, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, obviously going back to game one, that one should have been a blowout win for the Nuggets. I think obviously from that beginning, the, just their rebounding start at the beginning of the game and the lack of an, F answers that the Lakers had defensively for Jokic, it just seemed like it was going to be one of those blowout type games. And I got to give them credit. In the second half, the Lakers, you know, they fought their way back in. A lot of people in the media kind of made – 
a big deal about some of the adjustments they made coming out of that, the halftime, you know, and kind of getting back into the game. And, you know, a lot of them worked because with a few minutes left in the game, you had a chance to tie it. You know, LeBron missed a three. He was going up there and took a shot. I didn't really mind that shot because I think kind of the, the, Benefit you get for tying the ball game there is huge instead of, you know, driving to the rim and and getting two points and still being down one with like 40 seconds to go. So I didn't Mm -hmm. mind that shot. Obviously, LeBron has been on an incredibly bad three point shooting run pretty much this entire playoffs. But I think in that game one, you can kind of live with a loss like that. I know a lot of people in the media kind of made the Rui coming in and kind of guarding Joker as kind of a solution. I didn't see it as a solution. I think what it kind of did more is you kind of have a second big body on the floor where he can kind of stay in front of Jokic where AD can kind of roam around behind, which is where he's kind of most effective, just kind of roaming around that paint, kind of playing that help defense. He can come over the top, but he can also stay on his man over on the other side. So Jokic can't kick to it. I think what the Lakers have to do, and they learned about this more in game two, especially down the stretch, it's kind of counterproductive, but I think we saw a lot, one too many times, Schroeder kind of cheating in, trying to rip the ball from Jokic and leaving a wide open three on the outside. I think you cannot trade those possible twos for wide open threes when it comes to the Nuggets, because that's what they want to do. They want to see a double team on Jokic. And when you have those smaller defenders on the outside, like Dennis Schroeder, like Austin Reeves, those guys kind of cheat in to try to strip the ball like you'll do for a lot of bigs, and it'll work against a lot of bigs. It's not going to work against Jokic. And I think you kind of mm-hmm. just have to be okay with the fact that he's going to score 30, 35, sometimes maybe 40 points. But where he's going to kill you the most is when he's kicking that ball out to the three-point line and they're just knocking down shots. So I think defensively, we made a lot about Rui. I think Rui has played really good in this series. I think it's mm-hmm. just another body that can sit in front of Jokic and then frees up AD where he can play where he plays best on the defensive side, which is not kind of that one-on-one D, I'm going to take you, you know, mano y mano. It's more of him roaming, playing that help side, being able to come over the top and really affect shots that he's the most effective. So that's kind of what I saw really from game one, where a lot of people just wanted to give credit to Rui. I think it was a lot more, you know, intricate than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously game two wasn't LeBron's best performance. He no. still had a near triple double and 22 points, which for most players, you'd be like, that's a pretty <laughs> good game. Yeah, yeah. But we've seen performances from LeBron in the past, especially when his team's down in the series. And last night watching the game, I didn't really get a sense of urgency uh, from LeBron. I didn't really see him take over the game as we've seen him do so many times in the past, like with mm-hmm. some of those Cavs teams. Um, where maybe Kyrie Irving wasn't there or Kevin Love wasn't there, whether they're injured or Kyrie was on the Celtics or something like that. I didn't I don't know if we're starting to see a point where LeBron just can't do that in the playoffs this far into a series, uh, this far into a run where yeah. maybe he's feeling the effects from his foot injury or he's feeling uh, the effects of fatigue. What, what do you see from LeBron? And are you concerned at all with just he doesn't really seem to have that like takeover ability right now at the very least. Yeah. Last night in game two, I think he tried to take over. I think down the stretch, he tried to take over. And I think whether it be his age, I don't think as much his age. I think that foot injury, which I think is still an injury. And I think it's going to be announced right as his season ends. He's going to be having surgery on that foot. I don't think he wants to, but I think that's where it's going to end because I don't think he can drive the way that he wants to and really trust his feet. I think down the stretch of that game, he tried to take over. And I think really the biggest factor was that altitude. I think he was gassed. I think, you know, going in to that fourth quarter, we saw a lot of guys with hands on knees. We saw it also from the Nuggets. The Nuggets were gassed too. I mean, this is a physical series. Jamal Murray, he was knocking down those threes. He had enough in the tank. But even when he's shooting those free throughs, like you're seeing, like he's taking an extra mm-hmm. second. Like the, these guys, even the young guys, they're gassed. I think it was the first time I've ever seen Austin Reeves look like he was a little bit unenergetic and Austin Reeves he's you know he's young he's an undrafted kid he's hungry and I think the altitude really played a a factor down the stretch of game two I think it's one of the first times in the 20 years of LeBron that he hasn't been able to hit that button where he's seen an opportunity to go get a win and dominate really in the paint and he hasn't been able to do that so I think there if you're ranking the type of concern it's a little concerning but I do think, you know, playing those back-to-back games in Denver, I think that that plays a factor. I think his foot playing a factor. And I just think 
down the stretch when AD wasn't hitting shots, I think he tried to take over. And that could be a concern for the Lakers because if he doesn't have that extra gear, which we've been talking about how he's kind of saved that energy in the tanks for this last little push here, this last run, if he doesn't have that, then the Lakers are, I think they're drawing debt. I mean, they need him to be able to take take over down the stretch. So I saw a lot of the same things I think you did in, in game two, where it's like LeBron, he was pushing. I mean, obviously it was early on in the game, so he wasn't as gassed, but that missed dunk, you know, he talked about that after the game where it just slipped through his hands. And then also that layup, he had a chance to cut it. I think it was to one point, or maybe it was even to tie the game down the stretch there where, where they kind of made that, that last comeback with like five minutes ago. And he just he tried to do a reverse layup and it just it wasn't anywhere close. And when that happened, I said, you know, out loud in my living room, I'm like, he's gassed. I was like, he doesn't have it. He He's gassed at this point. Mm-hmm. So in game two, you know, it was it's it's interesting to see, you know, like I said, a lot of people are making this whole trying to figure out Joker. I don't think he's one of the you know best offensive players, best players in, in the NBA. You're not going to figure those guys out in their prime. But I just kind of wanted to ask you, now that we've seen the entirety of game one, ty- entirety of game two, we've seen pretty much the entire playoff run for both these teams. As we're sitting here 2-0, are you going to say that this series is over? Or do you think the Lakers still have a chance? I think the Lakers still have a chance. Personally, I think the Nuggets are going to win this series. But I think the Lakers still have plenty of time to make it interesting. I mean, LeBron's also won two series. Uh, once in 2007 and once in 2008, where his team was down 2-0 mm-hmm. to start the series. And they came back and won. So it, it won't, it's not unheard of. And we've also seen the Lakers play so well at times um, throughout the playoffs to where they look like the team to beat. Um, the biggest thing is just going to be consistency, yeah. which which has been a big struggle for Anthony Davis. As we saw last night, he was terrible. There's the whole joke that he can't play on even number games, but the odd number <laughs> games, he's fantastic. <clears throat> Every well, other AD, day. The whole point of this AD LeBron pairing was for LeBron to kind of transition to more of a facilitator role and have AD be the guy. Mm -hmm. Um, And LeBron James would complement that perfectly by being one of the best passers in the game. Easy to get the ball, easy to draw attention in a way from other players as we've seen him do so many times. But it doesn't help LeBron if Anthony Davis is a no-show and a net negative on offense, which was clear last night. So the Lakers are going to be in trouble if this is what we continue to see from AD because we had a big Roy Hachimura game, and LeBron, despite some blunders, had what for other players would be a solid game. Mm -hmm. And they still lost to the Nuggets, um, who they were ahead of by almost 10 at times every like for like two quarters straight so it's going to take a lot for the lakers to get back into this series but i wouldn't rule it out but i still think it's going to be the nuggets yeah but it's not looking good the way things are going yeah it's been a rough first two games um but i the the series i'm right there with you the series is not over and i have basically excuse me three reasons to support that um both games that we've seen so far this season have been games that have been decided in those last five minutes and while Denver obviously they've come out on top on both those games even with those two losses the Lakers and Nuggets have the same winning percentage 68.7 percent in the playoffs in clutch games so far this season so coming into this series Lakers down the stretch of games if they have had a lead in those fourth quarters they've been able to finish out those games and that was obviously a question mark coming into the playoffs so they've been good and even adding those two losses they've looked really good so I think with, you know, kind of the the clutch, how things go, I think water will kind of find its level there. And I think the Lakers will be better down the stretch of these next coming games. The second reason I have is last round, the NBA media was media was already declaring that the Nuggets and the Sun series was over after two games, because exactly what we saw in this series in game one and two is is we saw it even worse in the last series where the Suns went in those first two games were getting absolutely blown out. I think they lost that first game by 20, 25. Second mm-hmm. game was a little bit closer, but still lost by like six or seven. Excuse me. And then they made the trip to Phoenix and subsequently lost, you know, game three and four. Game four, Jokic even dropped 53 points in that game and lost. And all of a sudden the series was 2-2. So I I know, you know, Denver, It's I, don't, I still don't know how much – the altitude plays a factor, but I do think it definitely does. And if LeBron, who's been in this year, this league for 20 years, is talking about how, yeah, you feel it in Denver. It is a difference. I think the home court advantage you get from playing half your games there throughout the season, come playoff time, you get to play back-to-back game, you know, two games in three days. 
is going to help you kind of win those games. Obviously, you'd love to steal one, and they had a chance to steal possibly, you know, both of these. They had a chance to win. But I think we kind of saw in that last series where you take Denver out of Denver, and all of a sudden they can look like a still good team, but you get these role players playing at home, Austin Reeves playing back in front of that home crowd, D'Lo hitting threes back in the home crowd. I would not be surprised if we're talking about game five going back to Denver this series tied 2-2. And the third reason, Lakers in the postseason, just playing off of that, they're 6-0 and at home. They have not lost any game at home so far this season. And three of those wins have come out and blow, come in blowout fashion. Lakers home court, that's been a real factor these playoffs, and it will be this series, I think, as well, as much as just not having to play in that altitude at Denver. We both obviously know how quickly these series can shift, especially when they shift locations. Obviously, now the margins, they're razor thin for the Lakers. You have got to go out there. You obviously need to win both games at home, keep that undefeated streak at home. But I would not be surprised, like I said, a week from now, if we're talking about Game 5, Denver, 2-2 series. All right. So let's say uh, the Lakers and Nuggets going into L.A. Nuggets take one of the games. Mm -hmm. um, So they split the Lakers at home for the Lakers. How big of a difference is it if the Nuggets win game three versus game four to you, and how would that affect the series? Well, I think if you're talking about they're going to split, I think if you're the Lakers, it would have to be – that's hard. Because if they're going to split, you'd almost want, just as far as momentum, you'd almost want the Lakers to win game four. But then you're talking about falling behind 3-0. Like, then that's how you're talking. But if you're guaranteeing a a win in game four – I don't know. I, I truly do think I'm not ready to declare this series over quite yet, like I said, but I think if they lose a home game, it's over. The second the Lakers lose a home game, this series is over, whether that be game three or game four. They cannot afford to lose a home game and then force themselves to have to win both possible remaining games in Denver. I think that is such a tall ask, and they're not going to be able to do it, especially if you're talking about a game five and a game seven in Denver. There's no way they're going to be able to do that. So I think this series is over the second the Lakers lose a home game, whether that be game three or game four. So this has been an entertaining series. I just want to ask too quickly here at the end, what do you think kind of this series can have an effect, or what effect do you think they can have on both Jokic and LeBron's career and their legacies? Well, I think at this point, obviously, uh, this series is definitely going to have more of an effect on Jokic's legacy than anyone else because we've already seen Jokic win two MVPs and possibly mm-hmm. a third, and we haven't seen him in a finals game, which with, a, I believe, all the players that have won like multiple MVPs at this point, they had been in the finals. Don't fact, I, I need to fact check that. <laughs> But I believe that, list, that is yeah. the case because this is, yeah, it's a very small list mm-hmm. of multiple time MVPs. And you're looking back, you're thinking of guys like LeBron himself, Michael Jordan, Carl Malone, uh, well, Hakeem Olajuwon, he only won one. But a lot of those guys that won MVPs were champions or at least competing in finals. And as we've seen, um, even Giannis back to back MVP. Yeah. And he's a champion. Uh, so we haven't seen Jokic in the finals and for his legacy for to to reach another upper echelon of being one of the all time greats. He definitely uh, making the finals is huge for his argument just in the record books one day when his career is all said and done. And especially in a series coming against one of the all time greats, yeah. LeBron James, like that's another would be another feather in his cap. Uh, as for LeBron. Um, I mean, he's already won four championships. He's been to the finals over 10 times. Um, Obviously, getting to another finals would bolster his resume, but him losing here, let's say that they lose in the conference finals. Mm-hmm. If anything, this uh, their run has been a bonus yeah. to his legacy because no one thought the Lakers were going to be here after 12 games to start the season when they were two, <laughs> the and, two 10. and ten yeah no um and then they became one of the best teams in the nba after the trade deadline uh tied for the best team by record uh so it i it shouldn't ding lebron obviously people are gonna find excuses for it to yeah. ding it but at the end of the day no negatives against lebron this lakers team has outkicked their coverage in my opinion and for Jokic, the series could mean everything yeah 
Yeah, I'm right there with you. I In and of itself, this series can't do anything for LeBron. The only thing at LeBron at this point in his career that he can do is win another title. That's the only thing that can really affect his legacy with his numbers, with his his resume, all of his records. The only thing that's going to change is if he wins the title. I I think some people, yeah, I think it'll be a nice little just adding another number if he makes another finals. But I think for all, for all intents and purposes, the only thing that's going to really affect his legacy is hosting another you know, Larry O'Brien trophy. That's the only thing. As for Jokic, I'm right there with you. It could do a hell of a lot for his legacy if he's able to get this win. First off, go to that first NBA Finals. Like you said, there's not a lot of guys that have been back-to-back MVPs that have never made an NBA Finals. He can get himself off that list, whether he wins it or not, and go there. And I think winning this series, I think it'll truly kind of cement that he belongs in that top tier of NBA Mm -hmm. superstars right now. Obviously, the the hate is it's gone too far the other side. I've never been a huge Jokic guy as far as him winning MVPs, but I think that I think I've never said he's not a good player. And I think all of the, the pendulum has swung back too far on the other side, where there's so many people talking negative about Jokic. Look at what he's doing. I I was just saying for all the years, I want to see him do it in the playoffs. I want to see him make a run, and he's proven it. He's proven it, you know, in the first two series so far, and in, in the first two games against Lakers, and. That's awesome. I'm happy to see one of the best players get hopefully or maybe to the NBA finals. And if he takes out LeBron and AD, that's like you said, just another feather in his cap. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out and how, you know, things are talked about. And as far as LeBron goes, you know, obviously we know at this point people are going to talk. People are going to be like, oh, man, you couldn't get past Jokic or whatever. But we're I'm not going to get hung up on anything like that. We're just going to move on here over to the Eastern side. And that is, I would say the surprise of the playoffs by far. Mm -hmm. Miami's in the Eastern conference finals. If you haven't heard, Oh, and by the way, they took game one in Boston up one Oh against Boston. So the first question I have for you in this series, man, are you surprised at the Miami's heat run so far here in these playoffs? Um, At this point, it shouldn't become much of a surprise anymore. And even it shouldn't be a total surprise from when the playoffs started. Obviously, with the whole Milwaukee going down, like we didn't really expect that series to turn no. out the way it did, especially with Giannis being hurt. Although, as well as Miami played, even when Giannis was healthy, finally, I think it still could have been a competitive series either way. Yeah. Um, but with Miami, this team was the first seed in the playoffs last year. And aside from a piece or two, it's the same team. Absolutely. Um, we've also seen some players like last season, Kyle Lowry was not great. He's in a new role this year off the bench, and he's been fantastic for them. And Jimmy Butler has proved that, like I said, one of the biggest, best ever big moment players I think we've seen. Um, I mean, it's a reason why they they made it to the finals in 2020, which, by the way, all four teams remaining were bubble teams. So for the people out there that say the bubble championship (laughs) doesn't count because... Probably because LeBron and because the LeBron won it. won it 100%. Which everyone was under the same situations, the same like. If anything, they were hurt more because they were the one seed and had no home court the entire time. So for them to say that they had some, the only way that you should ever have an asterisk is if some team has some sort of inherent advantage. The Lakers did not have an advantage in the bubble. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why some people, the, well, I do know why people try to discredit it is because LeBron won. There's no other yeah. explanation. Yeah, but all the teams left here are teams that are not too unchanged from 2020. The bubble championship counts. But Jimmy Butler has been the engine for this run. He's showing that he is one of the greatest players in today's league. Definitely a top 10 player. I don't care what he does during the regular season because this is what (laughs) matters. This is the playoffs. Absolutely. Um, And. He's like he's what he's taken the Miami Heat to the conference finals three of the last four seasons. Yep. You know how many times the Bulls, Sixers, and Minnesota Timberwolves have been to the conference finals in the last four seasons? Combined zero times. Yeah. <laughs> zero. Absolutely. The man a franchise won't build around has willed the eighth seed. Realistically, they're a seventh seed, but willed this yep. team into the conference finals, and they're up 1-0 against Boston, who everyone, for the most part, probably thought were the favorites coming into the yep. playoffs. So. Absolutely. I'm just I'm not too surprised that Miami's here. Yeah. Yeah. I as a Heat fan, I can't say I'm surprised, you know, at what they've been able to do this postseason because it's kind of just what the Heat do. You know, they they 
They find talent that no one wants on that roster. Like half of that roster is undrafted. Seven shout, players. Shout out to Pat Riley and shout out to Spo, man. They just let him work his magic. And like you said, recently they've been one of the four or two last teams playing basketball in the NBA season. That's what they do. That's the culture that they've set. And no other team takes on that mentality of just give us a chance. Like as long as we still have a chance, as long as we get to go out there on the court and we're just playing one-on-one against another team, they like their chances. And Jimmy, he's talked the talk this this postseason, but he's walked the walk. He's like, I like our chances. I like the guys that we have. We have enough. And I think that kind of mentality, that message that he's sending to his locker room of, yeah, you know, we lost Tyler Hero in game one of the postseason. Everybody is like, well, even if they had the slightest chance, there goes your, you know, your basically second scorer out the window. You lose Vic Oladipo off the bench for the rest of the season. But him just kind of taking everyone in and saying, listen, we have enough. We don't have everything, but we have enough. And he's proven it so far. Made quick work of the Milwaukee Bucks. No one saw that coming. Had to fight a little bit harder against the Knicks. They had a couple of good games. And then coming here in this series, setting the tone in game one, getting that game one win in Boston. Because as we've seen with Boston, they can sometimes take their opponents too lightly. They can drop games. And if they're not knocking down threes, they are a beatable team, especially with a rookie head coach. I think you just have to give all the credit in the world to Jimmy, all the credit in the world to Spo, and all the credit in the world to Pat Riley. Building that roster, everybody wants to joke about the undrafted guys. Gabe Vincent, Caleb Barton are out there knocking down shots, playing huge clutch time minutes and finishing off other teams in the Eastern Conference. Kevin Love, you know, his, his touchdown passes, he's throwing down the court. He's been huge. Like you said, Kyle Lowry coming off the bench. They play deep. They have guys on the bench, too, that they trust. If someone gets in trouble or someone gets dinged up a little bit, those guys have had a lot of minutes being played this season. They're a dangerous team. Eight seed or not, you get to a certain point, seeds don't matter. And they are a dangerous seed. They are a dangerous team in these playoffs, and people have to start respecting them. And I just kind of want to ask your opinion, how do you think like we kind of got here? You know, How do you think Miami was able to get through those first two rounds and still continue to – be where they're at now, up one up. Well, I think it goes back to the spiritual leaders of the team, one of which I think is Jimmy Butler, obviously. Um, he's the best player on the roster, and he's always, since he's been in the league, he's always kind of had a chip on his shoulder. I mean, Absolutely. the man went from like a junior college in Texas to playing at Marquette, coming into the NBA as the last pick in the first round, and then not really having many expectations and then becoming the star of the Chicago Bulls. And we've only seen his star ascend from there. Uh, so like Jimmy Butler, this team kind of has a chip on their shoulder mentality. It's a Absolutely. bunch of players that no one probably expected to be on a roster. I mean, there's seven undrafted guys on this team. Tyler Hero is hurt. Uh, Victor Aladipo is hurt. They're they're missing key players in their rotation. Absolutely. And yet they they have not let that be an excuse. They've powered through every series they played in. They took out um, the the best player in the NBA yeah. in the Milwaukee Bucks, who had the best record. Um, they dealt with New York, and now they're going against Boston. Miami, they, they're going to take advantage of your mistakes. And Boston, as we've seen many times, like we saw in Philly, where they just dropped games. Or they let the Hawks hang around too long in Absolutely. that series, when that could have been done in four. Uh, Boston will let will have mistakes that if ha- if it happens, it could be pretty easy for a team like Miami to take advantage. And as we've seen, they're doing it here right now. Yeah. Boston has to figure out, they have to figure out how to hold on to the ball. They have to figure out how to limit turnovers because as this, we've seen with this team, Miami will score points off those turnovers. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why my Bulls aren't in the playoffs right now. <laughs> Miami's there in their place Absolutely. because Chicago gave up too many to you guys. No, absolutely. You know, and he won't admit it, but I think playoff Jimmy is absolutely a real thing. And I think he, like LeBron on the other side, they kind of know when they need to go maximum throttle and effort and when they can kind of ease off a little bit to make sure that their team can keep advancing. And we saw it in game one against Boston. He was full go in that stat sheet. It was it's too ridiculous to even talk about, you know, 35, basically 35, five, five, five and five or whatever. He -hmm. was insane. We and that being said, I think that we'll kind of – I think tonight we're going to see a little bit more passive Butler. I think 
He's not going to be full throttle. I would not be sh- shocked to see, obviously, Heat drop game two there in Boston. I think people, most people probably expect them to lose here in game two. Obviously, a little bit of desperation playing there for Boston. You can't go down 0-2 losing both games on your home court. That pretty much almost signals the end of the series. You drop those first two games at home. But I think tonight we're going to see those others try to, you know, keep Miami in the game. And down the stretch, you know, if Jimmy, he's been picking his spots, and it's a close game down the stretch. If he sees, hey, there's six minutes to go, we're down three, he's he's going to go for it. Like, you get a chance to get a win in the NBA playoffs, you got to go for it. I think Spo deserves a ton of credit, more than he's probably ever gotten in his career. I know Heat fans know this, but he's the best coach currently in the NBA. I will fight anybody on that. He is the best coach currently in the NBA. No if ands or buts about it. Zero coach of the year awards for him and he just keeps his head down and he wins. And that's the way of heat culture and that's just the way that they've been doing it. You got Godfather Riley up there in the stands just loving what he's seeing too. It's just I love what he the Miami Heat have built as far as that front office, as far as the stability in your head coach, and as far as the guys that you continue to bring onto your roster, but not just bring in, that you continue to develop. I wish a lot more teams in the NBA would try to develop players the way the Miami Heat does because they get a player, they'll have him for a couple of years. If they leave, they are such a better player than when they showed up in Miami. And we've seen that with how they've grown with all these undrafted guys. And I want to ask you, do you think Boston, as we sit right now, should be on upset alert? Boston should definitely be on upset alert. Um, Miami gave them trouble in the playoffs last year, took them to seven games, Absolutely. took them to a basically a last second Jimmy Butler shot that just didn't fall because yep. it just hit a bad spot on the rim. In and out. This team has been Boston's kryptonite for a while, um, and they should definitely be scared. Miami knows how to play this team. This franchise knows how to play this franchise, as we've seen yep. For years, it's been a while since Boston's got the best of Miami um, beyond the last season series, because uh, I think consistently Miami has just always been a struggle for the Boston franchise. Jimmy Butler has always been a thorn in the Celtic side. <laughs> I mean, when yeah. he was with the Bulls, they went up 2-0 on the first seed Boston then. So yeah. Butler just knows how to play this team. No, exactly. I, I'm right with there with you. Boston should absolutely be on upset alert. We've seen all playoffs for Boston. You know, they like to play with their food. Like you said earlier, they extend series that they have no business even extending and playing those extra games. They can take opponents lightly and under their inexperienced head coach in Missoula, you know, Tatum, we saw in game one, he can get sloppy down the stretch. He can turn the ball over. One of the guys, I can't remember who it was, but they're talking about last year in the playoffs, Tatum had 100 turnovers, it seemed like. Every time he was driving to the basket, that ball was getting stripped from him. Exactly. So I think those other and the others on the team can be really inconsistent if they're not hitting their threes. And the other team has Spo coaching against that. So I think they should absolutely be an upset alert. These teams have played each other a lot recently in the postseason, and we said all year last season came down to that Jimmy Butler three in game seven. They need to be careful or they're going to end up just like the Bucks and the Knicks, and that is at home on the couch. So the last question I have on this series is, do you think Miami has been respected, disrespected, I should say, by the NBA media, by Vegas, by whatever, so far this postseason? Well, when I saw after game one, the Heat were given a 13% chance to win the series, I think that's ludicrous. I think that's I, ridiculous. I love just real quick all those graphics that you always see, like old takes exposed and things like that. Oh, favorite all those page. those graphics of it's like ESPN. All the they have like fifteen analysts, and they're like they're all picking Boston. I'm like, whenever everyone is picking one team, it just it something lights up. You're like, really? Like you sure about that? You sure about that? <laughs> Uh, that that's like that one uh meme of like when it was a Bears Packer game and yeah. like Mike Dicka was the only person to pick the Bears <laughs> and you see him like all jovial smiling at his pick absolutely and then the Bears win that game which was like probably one of the probably the last one they've won <laughs> yeah one of the few times we yeah. beat Aaron Rodgers and the Packers which oh we don't have to worry about anymore but that's a uh <laughs> that's a subject for another podcast oh, man. um yes the Miami Heat have been disrespected. I wouldn't say by the overall media because a lot of people have been shining a light on Jimmy Butler. Um, I I see those heat press conferences after the game, probably more than any other team. He probably even more than LeBron Lakers press conferences at this point. Yeah. So it just, it really depends. I think when it comes to analysis, the heat are disrespected because no one's giving them a, a good chance or good odds at winning. 
Um, but when it comes to the media, I feel like to an extent, the media has been pretty positive towards the heat and at least towards Jimmy Butler. Cause he's been probably the biggest storyline of the playoffs. Yeah. I, I do think Miami has been disrespected. I will say by the media and by Vegas. And most importantly, I think it's been by their opponents. I think every team so far in the playoffs has looked at Miami as, Oh, we kind of got, you know, we got an easy series. Like we'll be fine. Like we can deal with Miami. And so far, the first two teams that have gone up against them have not been able to get through them. So I think you get to a point where in the playoffs, the team you saw in the regular season that no longer exists, Mm -hmm. you kind of have to change your opinion on these teams with the new information that you have. This Heat team is a real threat. I don't care what number appears next to their name when you turn them on on TV. I think you have to go with what they've done in the previous series now. And if you just kind of judge them off of that, they're one of the best teams in the league. Obviously, they're here in the Final Four. So... They know Boston. They know how to play Boston. I still don't think people take them as seriously as a threat, and I don't think they will take them seriously as a threat until they're hosting a Larry O'Brien trophy. Like, I don't think even if they take down Boston, they'll whoever they play in the NBA Finals, they will obviously be a heavy underdog against. They've been an underdog in every single series. I think Boston was like an eight-point favorite in Game 1. They're probably going to be like a 10-point favorite here in Game 2. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if Miami loses tonight, but it's like a three, four, five point game and Boston gets the win because Miami, they don't let wins slip away. They don't let games slip away. They do not get blown out a lot. And down the stretch, I think they have the clutchest player maybe at this point left in the playoffs. I mean, obviously, Jamal Murray over the first two games would make an argument for that. He was great there in game two. Yeah. But Miami... You know, down the stretch in those last, you know, second half, fourth quarter of games, you can make an argument they easily have the best player in the series. And I think easily they have the best coach in the series. I don't even think that's an argument. So mm-hmm. those things down the stretch of games, they can win a lot of games. So I think they need to be really taken seriously. And we'll find out tonight. Like maybe they can steal the second game and essentially just put this put this series out of reach early on. So we'll see where things go. But That's our breakdown there of the Nuggets, the Lakers, Miami, and Boston. A lot of storylines in those and just a lot of fun as those are going to continue to roll on. Mm -hmm. So while there's a lot of interesting things going on still in the NBA playoffs, a lot of the more interesting things going on in the NBA is a lot of talented and really head coaches with a lot of great records in the NBA are now without a job. And there's been a lot of guys been fired around the league over the last couple of weeks. We might see another, a couple more coming too here in the next couple of weeks. But as of right now, some big names such as Doc Rivers, Monty Williams, and Mike Budenholzer have all gotten the boot and is all looking for new employment. So we're just going to go through some of these guys and you just let me know what you think of the firing. And and if you kind of saw this one coming, I just want to start really kind of with the big one is that's Doc Rivers out of there in Philadelphia 76. Did you see this move coming? And do you think it's a good one? I I wasn't too surprised with this move um, because the Sixers haven't made it past the second round since Joel Embiid's been there. Yeah. um, Since Doc's been there. The struggle with this is I get sometimes you need to move in a different direction. But is that direction better than Doc Rivers? I know we we all make the jokes because Doc Rivers has lost like three three to one series. <laughs> He's he lost a lot. Loses yeah. a lot of game sevens. I believe the most all time now yeah, a lot. as a coach. But at the end of the day, I still think Doc Rivers is one of the better coaches in the NBA out there. I don't really know unless they decide to go in the direction of like Monty Williams or Mike Budenholzer. Which is kind of the funny thing. All these good teams are going to be swapping great coaches around, which yeah. is just kind of funny to me. Which I also have to say, I kind of feel bad for Quinn Snyder that he hitched his wagon to the Hawks yeah. too quickly because I feel like he's a really good coach that could have got a better job somewhere else had he just waited out the season. Um, because I wouldn't want to be in Atlanta as a head coach right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a smaller footnote that a lot of people probably don't think of, but you're, you're 100% right because Quinn Snyder kind of came in you know, 75% of the way through the season, you know, did what he did with them in the playoffs, stole a couple of games off of Boston. But you're right. He probably would love to be out there in the market trying to grab one of these top tier jobs right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, but I I wasn't too surprised about Doc's firing. How about you? Yeah, I think it was time. I think Doc kind of had to go for the 76ers. I don't blame him for, you know, the the downfall or blowing a 3-2 lead or losing in game seven. I think that had a lot more with to do with the play that was on the court. I mean, you have the MVP on your team who didn't play like an MVP those last two games. You had a a 
an a prior MVP in James Harden, who, yeah, he won a couple of games in the beginning of the series, but then really struggled in game six and game seven. And I think that has more to do with it. And now it's interesting because we've seen James Harden's going to opt out of his contract with Philadelphia, but then we also see reports that he was one who pushed for the firing of Doc Rivers. Mm -hmm. So we could have a situation where this player isn't even playing for the team and was the kind of key component to pushing for firing the, the head coach. So I, I, I'll be interested. This one's kind of I'm, the jury's out on this one. Like we'll see kind of who they get to come in and replace it. I think Nick Nurse might be a good fit there to kind of come down for Toronto, go to Philadelphia. I think kind of going from a culture guy to more of an adjustment X's and O's type of guy in Nick Nurse. I think that could be a good change. Um, I think they need to, they just need that second star. I don't, I don't think that has anything to do with Doc Rivers. I think it's unfortunate we see good coaches get fired all the time, but I think it was. I, I don't hate the firing just because it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, maybe you do need to move in a different direction. But I, I don't blame him at all for mm-hmm. any of those those losses. And you know, every series blown lead, game seven, they're all different. Every game seven is its own little thing, and it's just unfortunate that history is going to kind of look at him as that because overall i mean winning percentage wise he's he's one of the best coaches that the league really has ever seen so i think he's an historic head coach but moving on from doc rivers let's go to the younger monty williams man he got the boot there in phoenix what did you make of this move i think that was a terrible move i think there are a lot of factors on why this or the Suns did not advance past the second round this year part of it was uh obviously health as we saw chris paul missed the rest of the series with injuries. Um, we saw like the the sun struggled. It was basically a brand new team halfway through the season with a lot of the pieces they brought in and a lot of the pieces that they had to send out to get Kevin Durant. Um, so their depth wasn't where it was should have been. Um, obviously when you lose two talented forwards like Cam Johnson and Mikel Bridges, uh that's it's really hard to replace their production, even one bring in uh one of the most talented players on the planet just because those are two pretty able-bodied guys that have been part of the franchise for a long time. And it's an adjustment to bring in a superstar, although I would say I think uh, Booker and Durant played well together. Yeah, um, It's just that they came against a team like the Nuggets where they were one of the best teams all season and had mm-hmm. a lot of continuity and had a lot of familiarity with each other and with the roster. And I just, I think, Monty Williams, who won Coach of the Year, what was it last season? I think it was last season, yeah. When they and, were, and then yeah. you fire him. I just, I don't understand the logic in that. I was totally a one hundred percent against this firing. I think Monty Monty Williams is a fantastic coach. I don't think they're going to find somebody better to replace him. No, and I think it's an alt. It's ultimately a mistake. And this will be like Kevin Durant's like. I think it was his fourth coach and it, yeah. he'll be, be playing with four coaches, uh, four different coaches in one calendar year. Yeah. Yeah. That's this, insane. this one's really surprised me. I think he absolutely should have stayed at the helm there. I think the fault with the Suns and their downfall of the season, like you said, it was that lack of depth and that air to me is on roster construction and not the head coach. I mean, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the head coach can only do what he can with the guys that are on that bench, the guys that are on that roster. And I think when you're looking at trying to fix the Suns or get them back to contention, I think what you proved in you know since that trade deadline is that Devin Booker and Kevin Durant they they work together, they really do. And I think what you need to do now is you need to try to find a trade partner for like for Chris Paul and possibly for DeAndre Ayton as well, probably for DeAndre Ayton as well. And you just need a bunch of wings, a lot of versatile defenders, a lot of bodies. Get a little bit younger. And you just need to build up around those two because those two can play together. They can carry you in the playoffs. But I think you need to be looking at one of the the, the things that I saw thrown out that I don't hate is making a phone call to the L.A. Clippers and trying to reunite Chris Paul with the Clippers because they have so much wing depth. They have so much just kind of able body players with good size that I think you need and they need, you know, a point guard and, you know, Chris Paul, he is what he is at this point of his career. He's, he's getting out there in age. And obviously he, sometimes he's hurt more than he's out there on the court, but I think making a move like that could help them. They just need, it's that roster construction. But at the end of the day, I think the new owner, he just wants to get his guy in there. I think that's what this move is all about. And a lot of people are saying that the person who was sitting next to them with next to him with that whole um, Nikola Jokic shoving, thing that happened on the sidelines was Isaiah Thomas. And now people are saying, look out for Isaiah Thomas as possibly the next head coach 
of the Phoenix Suns, or maybe in the front office role, because it doesn't look like it doesn't look like maybe James Jones won't be sticking around long there in the front office. And just a couple of years ago, we were talking about how great of a job James Jones has done in that front office too. So I think this is more of an instance of the new owner wants his guys in the helm. And unfortunately, Monty Williams is is kind of, you know, the, the fall guy for that. But I don't see Monty being unemployed for long. I don't yeah. know where he's going to grab on somewhere. Maybe, I don't know, maybe like a Toronto or something like that for it's, him. I'd hate to just kind of hide him up there in Toronto because yeah. they just kind of are always mediocre. But mm-hmm. he, that seems like kind of maybe a move for him. A lot of really good players that he can kind of get the best out of. So I'd be shocked if he's not coaching come next. Oh, season. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Monty is a great head coach. I think a lot of people around the league are going to see him as the unfairly kind of the scapegoat of the end of their season. And at the end of the day, he got him to the second round. It wasn't like he was a crazy, you know, they were knocked out in the first round. He got a couple of games off of possibly, you know, one in four chance of being the NBA champions this year. So we'll see how things fall. But the last one I have is that Mike Budenholzer, man, he got the boot as well there in Milwaukee. What did you make of this move? Um, it's it's tough with this move because you can look back to the the 2021 season and say, hey, if the Bucks didn't win the championship, Mike Budenholzer was going to be fired that season. I mean, people were calling for his firing during those that playoff run, and then he goes and he wins the championship, and it's like it's any talk of that was forgotten overnight. Yeah, um, I think when you look at the firings of Mike Budenholzer. And you look at the firings of Monty Williams and Nick Nurse. It just goes to show that the head coaching job is and has basically always been a thankless job within the NBA community. Because it doesn't matter if a player, whether how dedicated they are to the franchise or not, gets you fired. Or whether it's an owner, someone in management having issues with you. Teams seem quick to let go of good coaches, which I think is always a mistake because one of the big things the NBA needs is continuity, especially teams with the young players developing. They need continuity. So getting rid of a good coach to hopefully go in another direction just because you're not breaking through to the next round right away. Like these, these are battles. It shouldn't be tearing down a good team or important components of good teams season after season, just because things aren't going your way. I think, in my opinion, the best way to, in some instances, to push through is keep that roster together. Keep yeah. players that like their coaches together. I mean, with Budenholzer, Giannis seems to be really fond of him. And Absolutely. this firing might not be a great thing for Milwaukee. I mean, we just saw the video the other day of Giannis thinking about Steph Curry. Now, maybe he was just joking <laughs> with whatever fans yeah, sent yeah. that message to him or whatnot. But in today's NBA... Any little move could send your superstar that's been there forever, maybe looking in, in other directions, maybe looking for greener grass. And in Milwaukee's case, being that small market, that's not a. That, are you really going to want to gamble like that? Are you want yeah. to gamble on pissing off your the greatest player in your franchise history? Not saying that Giannis is better than Kareem all time, but as a buck, I think Giannis is oh, yeah. the best buck of all time in terms of just what he's done for the franchise and how long he's been there. Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of this Budenholzer firing, but at the same time, it's not shocking because he would have been gone two years prior. Yeah, I'm kind of exactly in the same boat. I don't I, I understand the firing. You know, you're the no, number one seed. You get knocked out in the first round. It has been a couple of years since you won a championship, even though you did win a championship, as we kind of saw with Frank Vogel. He won a championship there with the Lakers and he got the boot last season. But mm-hmm. I I understand it from kind of a PR and kind of trying to make a move. You kind of look like you're you're trying to improve perspective, but I would not have done it if I was in in charge of the Milwaukee Bucks. I think they're a veteran team, and he's been around the game, and he's been around the team for a long time. And I think they were kind of just caught off guard by Miami, obviously dealing with the Giannis back injury as well. And I I don't think they never expected the Heat to kind of out effort them in that first round, and just kind of. And as we've seen, you know, Miami they're not a one hit wonder. I mean, we talked about earlier in the, here in this podcast where yeah they took out Milwaukee, then they took out the Knicks, and they're you know 
a quarter of the way there for taking out the Boston Celtics. Possibly after tonight, they're halfway there. So we'll see just how far the Heat can go. But I think it might be a little bit a bit of an overreaction from that front office, letting go of a good coach and Mike Budenholzer because mm-hmm. he's he's one of those guys. I don't know if he'll immediately get another head coaching job. I think he definitely could. He, he's deserving of one. But yes. he seems like one of those guys where he probably finds himself onto a really good bench with a really good head coach as that number two and then waits until a really good opportunity opens up. I think I don't think we've seen the last of Coach Bud, you know, in, in the head coaching position. But, you know, you never know. But we'll see I, how things go. I just thought of something. What if Budenholzer returns to the Spurs bench? I was just thinking that as I said that. as Because – and that kind of leads us into our next topic too uh, that we'll get to, but a hundred percent, you never know how long Popovich is going to be down there in San Antonio, Mm -hmm. probably looking for that number two to kind of groom, to take over, you know, a little bit more year after year. And you never know when he retires, what that roster is going to look like, because I I was thinking about that. The second you, I saw your eyes light up. I'm like, what if he finds his way back down on the pops bench? I, I think that could be a perfect spot for him, just kind of mm-hmm. waiting in the wings there because leading into our next topic here, as a lot of you have known, after a year of talking, we found out who won the Wemby sweepstakes, and it is those San Antonio Spurs. They got the chance to draft number one, and I think it's fair to say who they're going to be drafting with that number one overall pick. Yes. So kind of leading into that, man, what did you think of kind of that draft lottery and and where he kind of went? Is this a good fit for him? Well, I think this goes to show that the current draft lottery system continues to work as intended because this is another year, I believe the fourth year in a row, nope. the team with the worst record didn't get the number one pick. So it nope. shows that, yeah, this is a generally a solution to tanking to some extent. Um, now, fans of the teams where they're the ones with the worst record yep. complaining about like, oh, well, this this hurts our team even more. Well, like sucks. It's sorry. Well, it was even. That- the tweet from the Pistons fans where fan where he's like, man, I watched my Pistons win 16 games to get the fifth pick in the NBA yeah. draft. Yeah, that, that sucks. That's rough. But um, I mean, bright days are ahead for the Pistons. So Pistons fans, don't worry too much. You got a lot, a lot of young, talented players. Kate Cunningham's yep. going to be ne- back next season. That's my guy. And you could have Kevin Ollie coming into your franchise as the next head coach is Dwayne Casey. Yep. Kind of helps reshape that roster and that franchise going forward. Um. But yeah, this draft lottery, I think it the it worked out the right way. It kind of sucks cuz I'm living in Houston now and as cool as yep. it would be to see Victor Wembanyama like in person, um I think he's he luckily avoided the Houston yep. Rockets situation because it's tough when you have a talented player going to a franchise with a lot of multiple like f- top picks within recent years, like all playing together because these guys are kind of want to show like, Hey, I can be the man or yep. like, you know, Jalen green doesn't always have the best shot selection, stuff like that. No, <laughs> he, he'd be a player <laughs> that would take sh- touches away from one, but yep. which, so I think going to a place like the Spurs where, yeah, they have talented players like Keldon Johnson, but Keldon Johnson's not a true number one, not oh, a choose. I really like, uh, Keldon, not, yeah. I like him too, but he's not going to be your true franchise quarterstone. He's not going to be a player you build around. Absolutely. He can be a piece that you use to build around a player like Wemba Nyama. Absolutely. So I think he just went to the perfect franchise for that because the Spurs can do a lot with their roster down the road, whether through the draft or through free agency. Um, they're a team that has a championship pedigree as we've mm-hmm. seen in the last 25 years. Um, I mean, they haven't won since 2014 and, but that was due to one of the greatest nucleuses of all time, just aging out and Absolutely. the slow decline into just lottery picks and Mediocrity. all that. That this, yeah. yeah. But Popovich is still with the San Antonio Spurs. He has a system. He has a culture in place that has been there for over 25 years. He has a lot of knowledge and a lot of players and former players he can probably bring into the organization as we've seen him do in the past with like Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili. Duncan will be around. I can almost guarantee you. And Tony Parker maybe too. Absolutely. The French 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 connection connection. right there. Boris Diaw. Boris Diaw as well. Exactly. There. San Antonio has done wonders with international players yep. over the years. I can't think of a better organization that Wembanyama could have fallen to um, out of all of them. Yep. Orlando has some crowding. Yep. Houston has some crowding. 
San Antonio, I feel like it's easy. You can hand this the keys to the franchise to Wembanyama overnight. Um, yeah. And it's not in too overwhelming of a market um, to where, like, obviously, yeah, the media shift's going to be different in San Antonio. There's going to be mm-hmm. a lot more presence out there because he's there. But at the same time, like, because we've seen some international stars go to big markets and struggle at times. Yeah. I mean, we saw it with Chris Stapps before Zingas. Yeah, I think New York, here, yeah. Yeah, I think here it's just it's a great spot for him. And I'm excited because it's it's been weird that the Spurs have been as irrelevant as they've been <laughs> in the past six or seven years or so. I I, I want to see some glory return to that already. Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. Probably both of us coming up, we saw kind of the height of that Spurs, you know, kind of the, it was kind of the second generation. They all you almost look at them as they kind of had two back to back you know, mm-hmm. dynasties right off of each other. We kind of saw that second half with, with the, Timmy Duncan and all those guys, but it wasn't the team I was necessarily rooting for him to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as not wasting him and really having a great coach and just a stable franchise underneath him, this was a great fit. There couldn't have been a better fit for him. Mm-hmm. Like, like you, like we talked about that French connection to Boris Diaw, Tony Parker. And, you know, I think Tim Duncan is going to be around the organization a lot to help him coach Timmy. And then also, you know, he, we've seen them get the number one pick. What was it? Two times in the past. And it was David Robertson and Tony Par- or Tim Parker. So, Tim Tart, Tim, I am just mixing them up. Tim Duncan, you knew what I meant. Yeah, but, I knew where you're going. Exactly. And obviously those guys were big men that were, for all intents and purposes, a little bit ahead of their time. And I think they're going to be able to kind of help Wembenyama a little bit, kind of manage expectations, grow into his role in the NBA, kind of work on his body a little bit. He's not as skinny as like, you know, a Chet Holmgren, where a lot of people worry about his health. And obviously we saw he missed this entire, his rookie season after guarding LeBron in one, you know, summer pickup game. But I think, you know, obviously you can always afford to add on some more muscle, especially in, what is he, seven five? his frame. He's just so big. He's such somebody we'd never seen before. I was kind of rooting selfishly for a Portland because I kind of wanted to see Dame Lillard and Wembenyama. But yeah, kind of looking on the cool. bright side of that now is now maybe we finally get to see Dame just get out of Portland. I would love to see Dame, you know, on the side to get traded to the 76ers and fulfill that uh, James Harden role. That's what I would love to see, but that's probably a discussion for a different day. And then I was I was kind of rooting for Detroit because of my maid, my man, Cade Cunningham. I would have loved to see Wembenyama and Cade Cunningham, those two pair up, just mm-hmm. how young they are, how talented they are, and they could grow together um, in that Detroit market, which it's another smaller market. But as we've seen, they've had a lot of success in basketball too. You know, they've had a lot of good teams, not as much as the San Antonio Spurs, obviously, but they, you know, they've been down for a while, but they've had their glory days. They were a great team and people in Detroit, they love their Pistons. So, I think we can all just be happy he's not going to go to Charlotte in the worst front office in, in basketball. We can all be happy that he's not going there with, you know, that owner. I'm not even sure who he is over there, but whatever that owner is there in Charlotte uh, doesn't get rewarded with Victor Wembanyama. But other than that, you know, I think it's a, it's a good fit for the Spurs. It's definitely a good fit for the Spurs. Yeah. Personally, <laughs> I'm over the moon that he's not going to be a piston. Um, yeah. I just got over one boogeyman and one sport <laughs> moving on. I don't need yeah. a potential, another boogeyman for the next 20 hot, years. Hot your bulls for the my next Chicago bulls. Kids. Yeah, no, it's good. We don't have LeBron <laughs> anymore in the NBA. We don't have yep. Aaron Rodgers to deal with in the NFL. I'm happy that we won't potentially have to deal with Victor one, but Niyama. Yeah. Um, sorry, Pistons fans, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> Go bulls. That's deal with all right. Man. That's um, all right. <sighs> Oh, yeah. Joe, something else? No, no, oh, go okay. ahead. All right, got gotcha, you, man. Uh, moving on here to our last segment on the TMO podcast, and that is, of course, what we end every podcast with. That is our tee him up. Who are we handing out our technical fouls? Jared, go ahead and kick us off this week, man. I got to go to King James. Okay. I mean, it's just kind of getting corny at this point. We've seen um, a couple weeks ago, maybe one week ago, LeBron mm-hmm. in an interview saying like, oh, we don't like we don't practice on flopping. We don't work on flopping like that's not what we do here. Um, yada, yada, yada. And then last night he commits one of the most egregious flops ever. I'm sorry. LeBron's like, what, 280? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jokic 270. Is big, 270, 280. Jokic is a bigger guy. Sure. He's a Absolutely. seven foot, 300 pound center. But come on. No. Is Jokic really going to move a grown man like LeBron James across the floor like that? No. No. Good. 
LeBron James, as much as he wants to claim he's not, is historically one of the NBA's biggest floppers. He's not the only one that does it, don't get me wrong. And That's there true. was a lot of complaining on both sides toward officials, justifiably and unjustifiably so in many cases. But LeBron, you got to stop pretending you're not a flopper, man. There's even interviews of you back like in the Cavs days and the Heat days, like the first Cavs days, where you're saying, oh, I've, I have don't, I don't even know how to flop. I don't really know what that is. And then with your run in Miami, the, there we could put a highlight reel package alone from just those four years together of all the flops and just egregious ways to draw calls that you did not deserve that I had to watch in Bulls games and yell at my TV over. I, LeBron. You're a flopper, man, and you got to stop. It's a bad look. No grown man should be getting pushed across the floor like that. Pushed. If I'm in the NBA, I, I'm not flopping. I don't want to look like that. I don't want to look like a leaf in the wind if another man's pushing me like that. Like, that's, that's a bad look. That is a bad look to me. Like, just play the game straight up. If you have to resort to flopping, like, I lose respect for any players that do that. I'm I'm even pissed when I see my own players do it on the Bulls. I hate it. I hate watching it. It's bad for the game. It's a dishonest way to play the game, and it slows the game down. Teen up, LeBron James. Stop flopping, man. Man, I'm not gonna. I'm I'm not gonna get on LeBron too much for that because we saw as one quarter later when Nikola Jokic did the same exact thing. Down oh no, it's the next play. Exactly. And you know what? So it's the exact same thing. It happens it's fair, it's on fair. every team. And, you know, I'm not I'm not going to get into the Warriors, you know, just whining and complaining to the refs when they've been setting illegal screens against the entire NBA for an entire decade now. So I'm not going to get into that, talking about the illegal screens that they've said. I mean, there's I mean, what was it, the interview with? Oh, man, what was his name? The w- w- the big center that was part of the original Warriors. Bogut? No, a little bit what? after him, I think. That's the Cezilla? Pachula. Zaza Pachula. Zaza. Zaza. Zaza was interviewed this week and it was or not this week, but this year and talking about how many illegal screens he got away with on the Warriors where he would just lay people out. And it's because it's Steph Curry and Clay Thompson running around him. They got away with it. So I'm I'm not listening to the Warriors. Oh, want to I'm not saying the he's the only one to commit these. atrocities. Exactly. I'm just saying his. Yeah, was exactly. I, That's fine. His was Yo- an all timer last year. Jokic night. did it the very next play and got and got a call as well. So it, everything evens out. All is well that all is well that ends well. I am teeing up Mr. Michael Malone, who apparently I've been informed wants to be called. He gets mad when people call him Mike. So he is Michael Malone, coach of the Denver Nuggets. I'm getting really tired of his whining. Like, I I, I really am. His press conferences before and after the games, mentioning Darvin Ham by name when Darvin Ham, you know, has done nothing and just talked about after game one, you lose, and he all he's talking about is, you know, hey, we'll make some adjustments. We'll be bet- ready for game two. And then you got the other head coach talking about, oh, I'd bet every penny that I have Darvin Ham would rather be up 1-0 than, than down 0-1. It's like, yeah, why are you saying Darvin Ham by name? Something that you'd expect from a, That's something you expect from a rookie head coach like Hammer Missoula and not someone who's supposed to be a true veteran head coach. Him wanting to make sure that Jokic gets his flowers – when he's been in the discussion of sports talk shows for three years now, won back-to-back MVPs, almost won back-to-back-to-back MVPs. To me, that's not a good look. And now after last night's game where the story should be how they fought back in the fourth quarter, they defended home court, he wants to come out and say, put that in your pipe, sorry, quote, put that in your pipe, you smoke it, and we're going to go up 0-2. That's something I would hear from a Dylan Brooks, not from a veteran head coach in Michael Malone, when someone, and then when he wa- when some people are saying that the Lakers adjustments in the second half of Game One, you know, he's just he seems to be taking this super defensive approach to his team, who his team is the one seed. They have earned the first two games of the series. They're up 2-0. Congratulations. That's great. Nikola Jokic, he played great in game one. He was good in game two, but it was Jamal Murray that carried you in, in that end of game two. I'm tired of him whining in his press conferences with these quotes, and his, he's just being defensive and talking about how, you know, the narrative and the media. And if you're a true veteran head coach who wants to win a championship in the locker room, 
use all those narratives that you want about how no one believes in you. You know, you guys win game one and they're talking about how the Lakers are fine. That's great. But if you're going to get in front of the media and whine about the head coach on the other side, whine about how no one wants to give Jokic credit, which is ridiculous because all we do is talk about Jokic. He's one of the few guys we talk about in this league. That is a terrible look for me. It just comes across as him whining. And I don't understand that from a grown guy who's been around the league for so long, who obviously wants to win a championship. He's taking it so personal when behind the scenes, I get it. If you want to go in that locker room and you use all that as motivation, that is smart coaching. But to come up there and give the other team clips when no one on the, who on the Lakers has been disrespectful in this series. This hasn't the only one, even Jokic is giving props to LeBron and LeBron's giving props to Jokic. The only one in this series that is sparking a fire is Michael Malone. And I don't understand where it's coming from. I'm sick of his press conferences. I am teeing up Michael Malone. I am sick of it, sick of it. And we're only two games into the series. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I get that the Nuggets are playing with a whole chip on their shoulder and stuff like that, but it is a little weird to that for that to be the focus of his press conferences after every game. Although he does highlight a problem with the media when it comes to the Lakers. And it it's the same thing across all sports. All leagues have that one team you're going to talk about like that. Of course. Win or lose, you're going to talk about the, Lan- the Yankees at the end of the game. Win or of lose, course. you're going to talk about the Cowboys at the end of the game. And in the NBA, win or lose, you're going to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. I mean, last night after the game, I watched ESPN do like a 15-minute segment on the Lakers post game first thing. And then after that, they talked about the Nuggets for like five. Um, and, and that's just the nature of it. Right or wrong, I, as a prospective media member, I think we should shift the focus away from talking about teams like the Lakers in instances like that and talk a little more about what the Nuggets did, how the Nuggets did it, stuff like that, or any of the winning teams on that night. But at the end of the day, what's going to draw people in is when you do talk about the Lakers. So, yeah. like I, I get personally, he could feel slighted. The team can feel slighted. But at the end of the day, you can't be mad at the media for talking about a Lakers, an LA sports team, and LeBron James. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry. They're going to talk about it. And it, to me, it just comes across as whining before and after games. And I just want him, you know, I, I wouldn't be mad if he wins the championship. You know, if he takes out the Lakers and they earn it and they go there and they win a championship, I would hate to grow this hatred of Michael Malone because he's taking things personally. I just want him to ease up a little bit, play the games because no one on the court, it hasn't been a dirty series. It's been well played on both sides. That's what everybody wants to see. Games have not been decided by the refs. They've been two hard fought games and you came out on top in both of them. Congratulations. Now go finish the job. Like, that's what people want. That's what I want to hear from them. So that's all we have this week on the TMO podcast. I want to thank you guys all for joining us and following along on all of our social media platforms throughout the week for fun NBA content. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of NBA playoff games still going down. Another big game tonight, Boston-Miami game two. By the time you guys hear this, you guys will already know the result of that series. Hopefully, Miami goes up 2 nothing and almost punches their ticket to the NBA finals. But that's all this week. We'll be sure to catch you guys next time. And remember, that bubble championship counts. It does.